Brothers and sisters, I'm very grateful to my Father in Heaven for the privilege of attending another general conference of the Church with all you faithful Latter-day Saints who are here present this afternoon. The Savior said, Man shall not live by bread alone, or by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. And I'm sure that those of us who have been privileged to attend the last three sessions of this conference have felt a realization that we have truly been fed the bread of life eternal. We have had some wonderful counsel and inspiration given to us by the servants of the Lord. The bread will keep the body alive, but it takes more than that to keep the spirit alive. And the music has been wonderful. And just today, I'd like to compliment these singers from up at Rick's College. I was there just a few weeks ago to their devotional. And we can't help but thank the Lord for all the institutions of his church and what the, these institutions and educational opportunities are doing for our young people. Today, I thought that I'd like to say a few words about the kind of a foundation we have in our faith and that we live for and what our aims and our ambitions really are. And I think of when the, our beautiful temple here on this block was erected over a hundred years ago when the foundation was being laid, we're told that it's 16 feet wide and at one time, President Brigham Young came and saw the workmen throwing in chipped granite. He made them take it out and put in those great granite blocks with this explanation. We're building this temple to stand through the millennium. And then I thought, isn't that a good thought? And each one of us ought to want to build our lives and help our families to build their lives so that we can stand through the millennium. As we listen to Brother Romney in this morning's session outlining the promises of the prophets and the Savior himself regarding his coming, who is there among us that wouldn't want to be walking in that way that would assure us that when the trump of God shall sound and the dead shall come forth, that we with our loved ones can be numbered among them and share in, the, in his uh, presence. I think of the words of the Apostle John who was banished upon the Isle of Patmos and he was shown by an angel everything from the war in heaven and Satan was cast out to the final winding up scenes. He saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were open and the dead were judged according to the things that were written in the book according to their works, not just their faith, not just what they say with their mouths, but by their works. And death and hell delivered up the dead that were in them, and every man was judged according to his works. And then it goes on, and blessed are those who have part in the first resurrection, for over the such hath the second death no power, but they shall be kings and priests unto the Most High God, and rule with him forever, and the rest of the dead live not at all until the thousand years are ended. Who is there whose testimony has ever been touched by the divine spirit that would be satisfied to remain the thousand years when the trump of God should sound and they might have prepared themselves? And if it takes a 40 and 16 foot uh, uh, foundation to hold that temple for the millennium, then it takes a lot of obedience on our part to prepare ourselves for that glorious event. The Savior said, Matt, no, he said, straight is the gate, and now the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that go in thereat. And so we want to be sure that we're on that straight and narrow way that leadeth to life. And then he said, you remember upon one occasion, he that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, him I will liken unto a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And when the winds blew and the storms beat upon that house, it stood 
because it was built upon a rock. But he that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, I will liken unto a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And when the storm came and the wind blew and beat upon that house, it fell because it was built upon the sand. So that the kind of foundation upon which we build our lives is just as important for our eternal happiness as the kind of a foundation upon which they built that holy temple that it might stand through the millennium. Here a few years ago, while I was the, the president of the Southern States Mission, I delivered a sermon one night down in Quitman, Georgia, on the eternal duration of the marriage covenant and the family unit. I read from Brother Roland Howell's book. He has a chart there where he lists all the major churches and then their statement and attitude toward the major doctrinal sermons, including this one about the eternal duration of the marriage covenant, the family unit. And not one of those major churches believed in the eternal duration of the marriage covenant. I just can't understand how they could read the Bible and yet not believe, and how marriages could be performed in the churches all over the world until death do you part. What a slimsy concept. Why don't they go back to when God had finished the creation of this earth and looked upon it and found it good, and then he placed Adam here, and what did he say? It isn't good for man to be alone. And he made a help meet for him, saying, and these twain shall be one flesh. Now what God joins together and makes one flesh, you couldn't separate it without having two halves instead of two holes. And Jesus repeated that statement when he said that the man should cleave unto his wife, and they twain should be one flesh, and whatsoever God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Well, uh, at the close of that meeting, I stood at the door to shake hands with the people as they left, and a man came up and introduced himself to me as a Baptist minister. I said, did I misquote you here tonight? No, Mr. Richards, he said, but it's just like you say. We don't all believe all the things that our churches teach. I said, and you don't believe them either. Why don't you go back and teach your people the truth? They'll take it from you and they're not ready to take it from the Mormon elders yet. He said, I'll see you again. And that's all I could get from him that night. <laughs> the next time I went to that little branch to hold a conference about four months later, my coming was announced in the newspaper because I was the mission president. As I walked up to that little church, there stood that Baptist minister waiting for me. And as we shook hands, I said I'd certainly be interested to know what you thought of my last sermon here. He said, Mr. Richards, I've been thinking about it ever since. I believe every word you said. He said, but I'd like to hear the rest of it. Now, you know we never get talked out, but how could any man who has a true love for his wife and his children not want to believe that? I like the little verse written by, Na by Anderson M. Bathan to his wife, Beulah, in which he said, I wed thee forever, not for now, not for the sham of earth's brief years. I wed thee for the life beyond the tears, beyond the heartache and clouded brow. Love knows no grave, and it shall guide us, dear, when life's spent candles flutter and burn low. Now, there are people like that who believe that marriage ought to be eternal, but there isn't a church in all this world outside of our church, as far as I know, who believes in the eternal duration of the marriage covenant. Just think what a difference it makes in our lives when we know that we're to live on and on forever and forever. I would just as soon believe that death was a complete annihilation of both body and spirit as to think that when death came, it would separate me from my wife and my children and that we would not know each other. I tell you, there wouldn't be very much to look forward to. How could you want to live on and on forever and forever 
without a continuation of the love ties that bind you here. We see cases of kidnapping when children are taken away. I remember years back, I think it was in 32, when Colonel Lindbergh's little boy was kidnapped and a note left asking for $50,000. And he and others would gladly pay what they asked if they could get their boy back again. And yet here we come along with a knowledge of life eternal, like Brother uh, Romney quoted this morning the revelation of the Lord where he said that in the resurrection children would come forth and grow up without sin unto salvation. Those of us who've laid away our little ones in the grave, and we have that responsibility, a little daughter born to us over in Holland while I was president of that mission, and we kept her till she was three and a half years old, and my wife has said time and time again, that she knew the angels brought that spirit to her where she felt their presence, and yet we laid her away in the tomb. If we had to feel that that was the end, we'd have given anything in this world to have her back again. And then we come to this great knowledge that we have in the restoration of the gospel, that she'll be ours in the eternal worlds, that we'll have the joy of seeing her grow up without sin and salvation, and sometimes I've thought that probably some of these choice spirits didn't need the experience here of mortality like other children, and that's why the Lord has seen fit to call them home. We had four daughters before we got a boy, and we were sent to California to preside over the state down there, and our boy went out with a member of the high council and his boys, and he lost his life in an accident. That's the greatest sorrow that ever came to us. But now we're getting up on the top of the ladder, so to speak, and to look forward to know that these love ties are intended by God, our eternal Father, to endure throughout the eternities that are to come. It makes death take away. It stings to know that you're going to meet those that are so dear and sacred to you, and I thank God for this knowledge and I want to see our foundation laid in such a way that we will be worthy to stand with our loved ones and with the sanctified and the redeemed of our Father's children. Brothers and sisters, we're a blessed people. We're blessed in the, live, in the privilege of living upon the earth when the gospel has been restored and to have a knowledge of its truth. And we're blessed to have a foundation upon which to build our faith that makes every day a happy day as we associate with our loved ones. No wonder President McKay has so often said that no success in life can compensate for failure in the home. And the nearer men and women live unto God in keeping his commandments, the greater is the love in the home and a greater appreciation of the knowledge that that love can continue throughout the eternities that are to come. And every other thing, I want to tell you one more little experience, and then I'll close. While I was present down in the mission, a school teacher loaned a book to one of our Mormon children, and when the book came back, in that book was an Articles of Faith card. And uh, that school teacher read it, she went to her minister. She said, why can't, our why can't our church have something like this? And the minister couldn't give her any satisfactory explanation. And so she wrote a letter to the Bureau of Information here in Salt Lake. They sent her literature. They sent us her name. The missionaries called on her, and she joined the church. And then I think, as I read those articles of faith written by the prophet Joseph, and there were many other uh, important doctrines that he didn't put in there, how could anybody read those articles and then not believe that we have the truth? No other church in the world has such a foundation to build upon. And I think I'd like to recite, recite them to you in my closing here today. We believe in God, the Eternal Father, and his son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost, two separate, distinct personages as the prophet Joseph taught with bodies of flesh and bone, and the spirit 
the Holy Ghost of person to spirit. We believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression. And there are not very many churches that believe that. We believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. And most of the preaching today is that all you have to do is confess him as your savior. But those, our statement is that we have to do what he says. Then we, the next one goes, we believe that the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, repentance. Third, the baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. Fourth, the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. And I don't believe there's any church in the world built upon that foundation. And yet you turn to the sixth chapter of Hebrews where Paul said, leaving the principles of the gospel of Christ let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of faith toward God and repentance of dead works and the doctrine of baptisms and the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Exactly the same as we have in our articles of faith. And then it goes on, we believe that a man must be called of God by prophecy and by the laying on of hands by those who have a, a, a authority to administer in the ordinances of the gospel. And no other church believes that. They think they have authority by reading the Bible. Then it goes on, and we believe in the same organization that existed in the primitive church, namely apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists and so forth. And Paul tells us that this church is built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets with Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, and no other church has that. And then we believe in the gifts of tongues, prophecy, visions, revelations, and healings, interpretation of tongues, etc. We believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God, and no man can believe the Bible without knowing that there's another volume of Scripture that God has promised to bring forth and put it with it and make one in his hand. We believe in the, we believe in all that God has revealed, all that he does now reveal, and we believe that he will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. In other words, we believe in eternal revelation and that it shall continue with the church, and it is the church of Christ. And then we believe in the little gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the ten tribes, that Zion will be built upon this, the American continent, that Christ will reign personally upon the earth, that the earth will be renewed and receive her paradisical glory. And we know those things. And Isaiah tells us that when that day shall come, that uh, there shall be a new heaven and a new earth in which uh, the lamb and the lion shall lie down together, and we shall build houses and inhabit them, and we shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit thereof. We shall not plant that another shall inhabit or enjoy their build that another shall inhabit. But every man shall, uh, shall um, enjoy the works of his own hands. No wonder we ought to want to lay a foundation comparable to that foundation upon which that holy temple stands that we can be sure that we will stand with our loved ones throughout the millennium and may God help each one of us and our family so to do, I pray, and leave you my blessing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.